Okay, it's my pleasure to present to you all today. Uh, lead optimization with FEP Plus will be recounting a number of advances we've introduced in 2016 and also a sneak peek at uh, what we're planning to release later this year. So um, a, a very important initial topic is why we're worried about lead optimization. Lead optimization is the single most expensive step of preclinical drug discovery. It's almost one-fourth of the total cost of bringing a drug to market. So our expectation is anything we can do to make lead optimization faster and more effective should pay uh, huge dividends in terms of uh, accelerating the discovery of new small molecule therapeutics. Our belief is that free energy calculations should be able to help. These calculations promise faster potency optimization with fewer synthesized compounds, as well as better maintenance of potency while tuning ADMET properties. Further, we're particularly excited that these calculations can also be used to account for other properties relevant to lead optimization, including direct calculation of binding selectivity, mutational resistance, uh, solubility, and even things such as membrane permeability. So why relative binding free energy calculations? Our expectation is relative binding free energy calculations should have multiple notable advantages. Uh, first off, generally the changes to the system are smaller and thus the modeling of them should be more accurate. And often it's the relative differences of the affinities of the compounds that's of greatest interest to lead optimization. So a graphical way to understand these benefits is depicted on the right side of the slide. The hardest way possible to compute a relative binding for energy is to run a very long simulation where you converge the binding and unbinding of the first ligand, and then you run a second very long simulation where you converge the binding and unbinding of the second ligand. And then from the difference of those two quantities, you can get the relative binding affinity. Rather than pursue the relative binding affinity using that very expensive strategy, rather we use alchemical free energy methods to alchemically transform the ligand in the unbound state and then to alchemically transform the ligand in the bound state, which also yields the relative binding affinity through a much more computationally tractable uh, process. So the way these calculations are done in practice is you have a uh, real starting state. This is potentially ligand one. And then you have a real final state, which is ligand two. And then we alchemically interpolate between ligand one and ligand two using these intermediate states. And then using the machinery of statistical mechanics, we can compute rigorously the free energy change of the system for this alchemical process. In practice, bar and MBAR are almost always used. So our approach to the development of FEP Plus has been to try to uh, enable three key goals. The first is the predictions must be accurate, calculation setup must be straightforward, and the calculations much, must take less time than compound synthesis in order to effectively impact project chemistry. And in order to accomplish these three goals, we've introduced a wide variety of novel technologies uh, to enable these outcomes. Most of the key details are available in uh, the listed uh, references for the FEP Plus introductory reference and then also uh, the OPLS3 reporting article. So we've uh, made great efforts to retrospectively profile the accuracy of the method as reported in both the FEP Plus and OPLS3 paper uh, the root mean square errors of the predictions appear to be on the order of one kilocalorie per mole, and when you back sum, the correlations appear to be predictive, which suggests this type of approach can be used effectively to prioritize compounds in a realistic discovery setting. So I'd like to mention some of the specifics regarding the OPLS3 force field.
uh, introduced just this past year. This force field has extensive coverage of drug-like chemical space and covers more than 93% of drug-like torsions found in commercially purchasable compounds. And it also provides the ability to do on-the-fly parameterization of uncovered ligand torsions, which may not be uh, particularly well represented in the commercially available compound space, which can be particularly helpful if, let's say, the project is getting into novel chemistries. Likewise, we've introduced uh, virtual sites onto uh, aromatic nitrogens and halogens to better describe the charge asymmetries uh, of those groups uh, due to quantum effects. And lastly, we've uh, significantly updated uh, the protein force field such that it is now uh, competitive with state-of-the-art potentials. The OPLS3 ligand parameter quality is uh, very high uh, compared to earlier potential. So we have here the, the torsional root mean square errors versus uh, quantum data. And you see here that nearly the full set with OPLS3 is modeled with a very low uh, torsional energy error. You also see here that the solvation-free energies of OPLS3 are in much better agreement with experiment than most other alternative force fields. And it's actually uh, become very infrequent that the solvation-free energies disagree with the experimental data, which is of uh, great importance for the computing of relative binding for energies, since this term will be an explicit subcomponent of the pathway. Likewise, with the update of the protein force field, um, we can now well model the stability of different types of secondary structure. We're now with OPLS3, the stabilities of these small peptides that exhibit secondary structure are well modeled compared to the reference experimental data. And likewise, our protein armistice and our dynamic simulations now tend to have much tighter agreement with the crystallography than was possible with earlier variants of OPLS. And also now looks as competitive, it looks to be competitive or possibly even slightly better than uh, many alternative protein force fields. So with these force field improvements in hand, we reran uh, the test set originally introduced in the 2015 JAX paper. And without any fitting or development specific to this data set, we see the introduction of these new uh, force field uh, parameters has increased the accuracy of FEP simulation versus the target experimental data. So it's one of these rare instances where you're getting right answers for right reasons without explicitly parameterizing for that particular uh, data set. One other aspect I would want to highlight about this force field development work is it allows for the capturing of subtle SAR elements that may be difficult to capture otherwise. So for instance, I have here three factor 10A inhibitors that um, bind to the S1 pocket. And experimentally, molecule 17D is a much tighter binder than 17H. But OPLS2, the earlier version of the force field, had trouble capturing the degree of drop-off in activity, transforming from 17D to 17H. With the introduction of virtual sites for aromatic nitrogens, we well capture this affinity trend. And you can even see by eye the basic problem that's coming up um, with ligand 17H, where the introduction of those lone pairs introduces electrostatic clash between the ligand and the protein, which is very, very hard to capture unless the lone pairs on those nitrogens are explicitly represented. So in, in FEP, there is a very clear domain of applicability of the technique. The major constraints on the application of the technique are the following. We generally need at least one high-quality crystal structure with a co-crystallized ligand, and we also need some reasonable expectation of a conserved binding mode across the series. Likewise, uh, because these simulations are run with an initial ionization state assignment for both the protein and the ligand, we would want to see minimal tautomeric ionization state and stereochemistry, uh, stereochemical uncertainties across the series. <clears throat> 
Likewise, we would ideally like to see high, reliable, uh, high reliability experimental binding data from the same assay for all of the compounds. And we would also want uh, to be in a situation where we have confidence that the assay data and the crystal structure are for the same protein construct. Failing to meet these criteria does not necessarily guarantee failure, but it does make it more likely because now there are uncontrolled approximations being made in the modeling. Uh, perhaps the most severe of these is if the crystal construct and the protein used in the assay have different sequence. In that circumstance, the FEP calculations could be highly predictive for the crystal construct, but the assay is just um, being run with a protein with different intrinsic binding affinity to the various uh, members of the series. In general, we find with the application of FEP, the cleanliness of the experimental data is much more important than the identity of the target or the type of ligand modification being pursued. So recently we've completed a large-scale retrospective of the accuracy of FEP on multiple different projects. To date, we are aware of 101 targets for which FEP calculations have been run. And for 78 of these targets, we have sufficient access to the primary data to do a detailed uh, accuracy analysis. This data set covers over 3,000 distinct ligands, and the data comes from a mixture of 14 biotech companies 19 pharmaceutical companies, four universities, and 24 internal retrospective studies. The breakdown between retrospective and prospective applications of the technology include three blind retrospective studies, 58 completely retrospective studies, 23 prospective studies, and 11 mixed studies where both retrospective and prospective work was done in the context of preparing the study. Across all of those targets to date, all those different project situations, the mean unsigned error and the root mean square errors appear to agree very well with our earlier published work. And on average, 84% of the predictions across all projects had errors less than 1.4 kcal per mole, or a log order of binding affinity. We have this outcome depicted uh, graphically on this slide where you can see the vast majority of projects, the majority of the predictions were um, more accurate than one kcal per mole. I would add from a methods development perspective, we've always been most interested actually in this section of this graph, the higher section of the graph, because that um, in terms of us being methods developers gives us the opportunity to further improve the technique for future use cases. When we were pulling all of this together, we had to reach out to a very large number of parties. Um, some of the emails we got back were particularly interesting. Uh, a lead chemist on one of the projects told us quite bluntly, we are not making any compounds without our having an FEP prediction. From another project, they were particularly impressed that inspection of the FEP dynamic trajectories often uh, were found to predict binding modes exactly as they were observed later in the crystallography. And a different um, headman chemist on a particular project uh, told us that the deployment of FEP has enabled the discovery team to uncover hidden selectivity drivers and design multiple drug-like chemotypes that possess superb potency for target one and exquisite selectivity versus target two. So they, they were quite happy with uh, the outcomes of using the technology. With regard to the higher error series, we turned up very interesting things. Uh, the worst the predictions have ever looked had to do with a system where it had an, a histidine of an ambiguous protonation state in the active site. Um, subsequent to the prospective work, we realized that the initial protonation state of that residue may have been incorrectly assigned for some of the ligands, and we now believe that if we were going to do subsequent rounds of prospective work, we would be capable of making much more accurate predictions for the system. Uh, other high error targets were generally either systems with very highly flexible active sites, uh, metalloenzymes, or systems where the, the original crystallography was really quite poor, and there were a, a large number of structural uncertainties surrounding the modeling. 
That said, we are actively working to improve the technology to enable it to achieve higher accuracy for such targets. So the major recent methods developments connected with FEP Plus include the release of core hopping FEP and extension of that technology to macro cycles. They include uh, uh, development and validation of covalent inhibition FEP and also the realization of large-scale FEP to facilitate design. In drug discovery projects, we would generally like to be able to change the size of rings in the core of a molecule and also introduce new rings into the uh, core of the molecule, such as transforming this more um, simple ring into a bridged system. However, core hopping has generally been regarded as very challenging for at least two reasons. The first is synthesizing a molecule with a new core may require months of effort of a highly skilled chemist in order to make the molecule in the first place. And even more disconcertingly, most core hopping attempts ultimately fail to yield type binding matter, which means that after sinking in these, these months of work of the, the chemist, ultimately nothing of value to the project is delivered. This is reviewed very clearly in this Drug Discovery Today article where it states quite bluntly, because the topology of the pharmacophore is being modified, a considerable loss of biological activity can be expected from most new scaffolds. However, despite the cost and low probability of success, core hopping is very common in drug discovery often is the only viable strategy to resolve an anatomy tox issue, and likewise, identification of novel active matter may require core hopping away from existing intellectual property. So our hope and expectation is that FEP Plus should now help chemists to pursue core hopping modifications. With much greater confidence, the resulting molecules will bind with the potencies needed to potentially become drugs. So why is this so challenging? In our group FEP, the leftover dummy atoms generally will not change the ensemble of the target molecule. So you can see here sort of in your mind's eye that this methyl group can either point in the direction of this nitrogen or point away from the nitrogen without any artifacts being introduced by the presence of this dummy atom. However, with core hopping FEP, you can have artifacts. So for instance, if I want to perturb from this tricyclic system to this more, more simple ligand, if I leave these dummy atoms in place, I, they still have bond stretch terms and that will prevent this ring from freely flipping. So rather than just turning off their non-bonded interactions, I must actually try to annihilate a bond stretch term directly. And historically, this type of transformation with FEP has been believed to be either extremely difficult or possibly outright impossible. Our solving this problem required a complete reworking of how the bonded terms were described in MD simulation. We've been able to invent a soft bond potential where the potential is truly harmonic at lambda equals one and exactly a flat potential at lambda equals zero. And further, the first and second derivatives of this novel potential are continuous for all values of lambda and r, even when r approaches infinity, which is important for certain formal requirements of the FEP calculation to be well posed. The details of all of this work have recently been published in JCTC. And just some examples of applying the technique where we're transforming from a bicyclic system to a monocyclic system, we transform back to the bicyclic system, and again back to the monocyclic system. And we have here tallied all of the core hopping transformation edges in this table, and we see here the error of these transformations are generally in line with the errors we typically see for non-core hopping transformations. 
suggesting we should be able to predict such transformations reliably when working prospectively. We're also able to do more complicated changes, such as the introduce, uh, introduction of a bridged ring into a system. And here we have an instance where we're changing the size of a ring in the core of a molecule. And this example is particularly interesting because the authors chose to publish uh, dead molecules. These are actually hard to find in the published literature where we see here that the technology is able to correctly capture this abrupt drop off of affinity transforming from ligand 2D to ligand 3A in agreement with the experimental data. So the RMSC, the root mean square error of a retrospective testing of core hopping FEP is less than a kilocalorie. Uh, it appears to be quite accurate. However, the number of cases we've tested so far remains quite small simply because people tend not to publish failed core hopping attempts. That said, we're expecting the accuracy of core hopping FEP to be comparable to more common R group FEP calculations. And theoretically, with the introduction of the soft bond formalism, there should be no difference in the accuracy profiles of these two different types of perturbations. Core hopping FEP and R group FEP are fully integrated into the current release, and the FEP mapper GUI will dynamically apply whichever perturbation scheme is most appropriate for that particular type of ligand transformation. So we've recently been able to prospectively validate this technique working with a collaborator. The collaborator became interested in a molecule that was recently sent into clinic that had subnanomolar in vitro potency. That molecule had a relatively simple monocyclic core and all obvious substitution patterns were covered by previous IP filings. Working with the collaborator, though, we applied core hopping FEP to this clinical compound where 100 synthetically plausible alternative non-monocyclic cores for this molecule or, or not for this molecule were enumerated and scored with FEP. Of these 100 that were enumerated and scored, only six appeared interesting enough to be flagged for synthesis. And working with the collaborator, two molecules manifesting one of these new uh, chemotypes were successfully synthesized and assayed. We and the collaborator were very excited to see that both molecules were highly potent and not covered by earlier patents. Both molecules right, right out of the box were sub-nanomolar and actually within uh, one log unit of the affinity of the target molecule. And the mean unsigned errors of the FEP predictions for these two molecules were actually less than one log unit, suggesting that this accuracy we've observed in the retrospective profiling of the method should indeed hold up um, for prospective applications, as was observed here. Perhaps most excitingly, using core hopping FEP, the discovery of this novel, highly potent chemotype required only two and a half months of calendar time from the original ideation of the molecule to its um, assay confirmation. So where we'd like to go next with this is macrocycles. But unfortunately, the proper assignment of atom mappings and interaction mappings between different macrocycles, potentially very diverse macrocycles, is not yet fully automated and can be time consuming. And if one wants to transform between a linear molecule and a macrocyclic species, that may require unusually large interaction cutoffs and water boxes. Further, because uh, there's a great deal of conformational flexibility that can exist for the linear molecule and the macrocycle, for these calculations to be predictive, simulation convergence must be carefully monitored. That said, despite these challenges, our initial proof of concept data for these types of transformations, in my opinion, looks quite promising. So just to give an example of the types of systems we're interested in, here's an example of a base inhibitor 
where this is the linear species, and at some point the macrocyclic variant was explicitly synthesized and crystallized. We would ideally like to be able to compute prospectively the change to the binding for energy of transforming from this type of linear species to this more complex macrocyclic species. And our initial data appears quite compelling, where if one takes careful efforts to ensure proper interaction mappings and atom mappings have been assigned and also runs these simulations with large water boxes so that you're sampling the full change in the flexibility of the linear molecule versus uh, the macrocyclic variants, it does appear possible with the current technology to effectively score such changes. Something we were particularly excited to see is these calculations do appear to have the ability of catching some rather subtle effects. So for instance, by eye, um, ligand three and ligand four might be very hard to score just with a guess as to the relative flexibilities of these rings, or of these um, larger macrocyclic systems. But the calculations do correctly capture that ligand three, it binds more tightly to the system than ligand four uh, in agreement with the experimental data. So our initial testing on macrocycles appears very encouraging, but more validation, further automation of the protocol is clearly needed. And we're working to identify additional test cases and further optimize and develop the approach, uh, ideally with its release sometime later this year. So now switching gears to discuss uh, covalent inhibition and how to model it with FEP calculations. So FEP analysis of covalent inhibitors has traditionally been a basic research topic, and to our knowledge, minimal prior work has been reported. To score such inhibitors, we believe we must be able to construct a thermodynamic pathway that includes the contribution of the formation of the covalent bond implicitly. This work was motivated in large part by a collaborator with deep covalent inhibitor design experience and interest. The basic issue one runs into with covalent inhibitors is there may be an experimental ambiguity regarding what states actually contribute to the measured binding affinity. So for instance, is it always the case that the concentration of the covalently linked product is always much greater than the concentration of the pre-reactive species? If that's not the case, you might need to model the concentration of these two species independently, which may be quite complicated. There is a significant simpli simplification, though, that's possible if one assumes the dominant species is the covalently linked product such that you can compute the relative affinities of these two ligands simply by performing the perturbation with the covalent bond in place, and then once again with the covalent bond not in place and with the ligands actually disassociated from the protein. So again, to summarize, we suspect many common assays may actually be measuring the ratio of the pre-reactive form and the reacted form versus the free concentration of protein. And the particular calculation strategy we've worked out assumes that um, the concentration of covalently linked ligand must dominate in the bound state. We expect this to be true for most ligands, but it could break down unexpectedly. And we further believe it may be possible to formulate a scheme that does not assume this, but this will require both basic research and significant code development. One other limitation about this technique I should mention is that this will only work for reversible covalent inhibitors. If the inhibitor is an irreversible binder, then you're not um, measuring a true free energy in the assay, rather it's a, it's a kinetic quantity, and that would have to be modeled through a different technique. So the collaborator uh, recommended we review uh, data from this Emka et al. ChemMed Chem paper that reported 26 ligands with affinity data for uh, HCATL, where they had also deposited a crystal structure for the system. We had clustered the ligands into two congeneric 
subgroups. And we found that uh, we also couldn't score ligand 6 due to its uncertain stereochemistry, large structural variation, and net charge variation. So group 1 was reasonably congeneric um, of the types of, you know, the types of congenericity we like to see when we score ligands with FEP. Ligand uh, group 2 was considerably more diverse, and this was more attempted as sort of a moonshot. This is more diversity than we would typically attempt to model in a more routine application of FEP. So one last implementation detail here. The actual calculation is run with the covalent bond in place between the ligand and the protein for the, the bound state leg of the calculation. And then the free state, we use a fictitious dipeptide reference for performing the perturbation so that the contributions of the dummy atoms will exactly cancel between the bound state and the unbound state. Uh, that's very important so you don't have these entropic artifacts in the final computed free energies. So the results for the group 1 ligands looked really quite good in our opinion. The root mean square error if ligand 25 is excluded was less than a kilocalorie. Ligand 25 was an extreme outlier and it's omitted from the plot here. We'll revisit that later in the presentation. The group two ligands, despite their extreme diversity, did uh, fare quite well. This root mean square is a bit larger than what we typically see for uh, non-covalent um, series, but we thought this looked compelling enough that we felt comfortable proceeding with the collaborator. The collaborator. So here's showing the results for both series combined. Ligand 25 was clearly exhibiting a behavior very different than the other ligands. And this was never really satisfactorily resolved. So we have here two type binding species, and then we have ligand 25 that exhibited essentially no measurable binding and only differs from a type binder due to the replacement of a methyl group with a trifluoromethyl group. After taking several different stabs at this outlier, we're suspicious this may actually be a place where the underlying uh, theoretical framing of the method may be breaking down, and it may be that this is uh, binding with some state that is stabilized that is inconsistent with the formation of the covalent bond. That's something we're still investigating. So we were originally very excited about these results and believe they may be the first FEP calculations reported for covalent inhibitors that implicitly include contributions from the formation of the covalent linkage However, more validation was clearly needed, and we were very excited that based on these results, in part, our collaborator was willing to test the method prospectively with us outside of a drug discovery campaign such that we could um, speak very openly about the results. So we mutually agreed to the optimization of this particular HCATL inhibitor and it was an interesting exercise because we wanted to build into the S2 pocket. And limited SAR had been reported for similar covalent inhibitors earlier. And the SAR was actually quite interesting where even for these small, simple hydrophobes, there were still surprising activity cliffs being manifest. And we were um, mutually very curious to see if FEP calculations would be able to recapitulate these uh, surprising activity cliffs and SAR trends. So the collaborator provided us a 3,325-member uh, R-group library, and all design ideas were docked and scored with Glide and Prime MMGBSA for idea triage which took approximately uh, two days using modest uh, compute resources and human time investment. From this initial triage, we decided on a set of 92 molecules for advancement into FEP scoring based on the glide docking, the MMGBSA scores, and also just a manual inspection of R-group diversity 
in that we wanted to allow the FEP calculations to potentially tell us something uh, new, something unexpected. So we wanted a very diverse set um, to be simulated. Um, that was not an enormous compute commitment. It only took us about five days on about 64 GPUs. From those calculations, we selected 10 primary molecules and five backup molecules for synthesis and assay uh, by the collaborator. So we were excited to find out uh, the collaborator did succeed to synthesize and test nine of our FEP plus prioritized molecules. And perhaps equally as excitingly, the collaborator was also willing to have a medicinal chemist uh, recommend 10 molecules for synthesis based on the SAR data in hand at the time the uh, recommendations were made. They also had nine molecules prioritized by docking and filtering also flagged for synthesis and also 10 additional molecules prioritized by visual inspection of the docked molecules where they wanted to keep molecules that formed key preferred interaction motifs with the system. So this gave us an opportunity to compare the quality of the FEP recommendations versus um, alternative commonly pursued design strategies. So we were very excited about the results. It turned out seven of the nine molecules recommended by FEP that were later synthesized bound more tightly than the reference molecule, whereas the other um, recommendation techniques only succeeding in finding a single molecule that was tighter than the reference. Further, molecule F50 was identified by three of the four approaches and actually was very, very close in structure to a known tight binder. So the most surprising aspect of these data is not necessarily that all th uh, these three recommendation techniques found that type binder, but rather the docking actually missed that type binding molecule. Regarding the, the predictions themselves by FEP, we were very excited to see the numerical agreement of the experimental and predicted values, but also the diversity of the molecules that FEP ultimately led to the synthesis of, including everything from this uh, very small trifluoro group all the way to these more expand and more elaborated ring systems that might be very interesting starting points for further discovery work. And now uh, switching gears to the last topic, which is large-scale application of FEP for design. We've been delighted to work very closely with Nimbus Therapeutics, where we've been able to deploy large-scale FEP simulations for the optimization of potency, selectivity, and also FEP simulations for the optimization of small molecule solubility in late stage lead optimization. So the backdrop for this exercise is prior to initiating this large scale FEP screening campaign, no molecules had been identified for the project which had simultaneously achieved high potency, selectivity, and solubility. Um, many molecules achieved partial success, but no molecules were found that were satisfactory across all four criteria. So I have this tabulated on the right, where if you notice, molecule A is potent and it's selective, but it's essentially insoluble. Whereas molecule B is potent, selective against the first anti-target, it's soluble, but it's not selective against the second anti-target. And they had a number of molecules that were almost but not quite good enough. And we were curious to see if large-scale application of FEP could more efficiently point them toward a completely satisfactory matter. So in a period of about six months, we scored about 4,000 molecules using FEP, which would have been the equivalent of um, five years of wet lab experimental chemistry uh, given sort of typical synthesis rates we're seeing. And the goal here explicitly was to marry the expert molecular design of the project chemists with the predictive scoring of FEP to enable the undertaking of challenging synthetic targets. <laughs> 
So the FEP scoring campaign has been hugely successful. And at the time these slides were put together, 10 molecules had been identified meeting the potency, selectivity, and, uh, and solubility goals of the project. So we, we have here the, the dates in which they were synthesized. I would point out that molecule I is actually a trivial analog of molecule E um, that was not run because it's charged and we can't change the total charge on the molecule, but I sometimes like to think we get partial credit for the synthesis of molecule I. To identify these potent, selective, and soluble molecules, all 10 of them, only 46 FEP recommended compounds were synthesized over that time period, showing the, the very large true positive rate uh, these molecules, uh, these methods have when recommending molecules in the context of prospective design. One aspect of this work that was particularly interesting to us is uh, the parent compound of these molecules was molecule D, which was actually from a different subseries than many of their uh, best molecules at the date we were initiating this exercise. Had we not had the computational throughput to attempt to optimize all of their different available subseries in parallel, it's plausible we would have never discovered that um, if the subseries manifest by molecule D actually had more room to run than some of the earlier project series. Um, further, a number of these molecules were actually fairly synthetically challenging due to the chemistry of the core, and the um, lead chemist on the project has told us that it was very unlikely a number of these would have been made without the benefit of the FEP plus scoring. Likewise, the calculations themselves were able to pick up some rather subtle effects. So for instance, molecule D was uh, quite insoluble, um, but molecule F here was actually quite a bit more soluble. And it may be counterintuitive that introduction of an additional CH2 group could enhance the solubility of molecule F. The reason for that appears to be that the increased configurational entropy of this seven-membered ring opposes the formation of the solid form, which leads to um, enhancement of the, the solubilized state, uh, which leads to the solid form being less stable. Um, being able to capture those types of counterintuitive trends in the structure activity relationships and the structure property relationships, we believe, has really been helpful to uh, help to advance the project. Um, so one last recent bit of work I would like to call attention to is we've recently co-published with Nimbus this current opinion and structural biology paper where we describe how computational modeling helped to advance uh, drug discovery projects targeting acetyl-CoA carboxylase and also tyrosine kinase too. Uh, crucial aspects of the successful use of WaterMap and FEP plus on these projects are discussed in detail. Um, one aspect of those successful applications that, that may sometimes be given short shrift in these types of technology discussions is the way in which um, the computational modelers and the project chemists uh, can interact most effectively with each other. The ideation process is the beginning of everything for us. From that ideation process, we can do fast preliminary triage using empirical methods such as uh, log-D, MMGBSA, permeability prediction, the best of those molecules from the preliminary triage are advanced to the FEP predictions. And then there's a fork in the road at the FEP predictions. If the molecules look great, those can be advanced directly to synthesis, to assay, and then ultimately to PKPD if they look good enough. But if they don't look good, we have an ability to analyze the trajectories, analyze what's actually happening in the calculation to inform future ideation, which in turn leads to different molecules going into the triage process. So this ability to iterate very quickly to get good-looking matter on the computational side has allow, allowed us to accelerate projects where only the, the best appearing molecules are advanced. Um, for synthesis prioritization and ultimately uh, assay and experimental testing. 
So with that, I'd, I'd want to thank all of the people involved in um, achieving this work. Um, one of the best parts of working at Schrodinger is the ability to work with so many highly talented people, and also to thank all of our collaborators for uh, their generosity in allowing us to, to attempt to use these methods to advance projects. And with that, I think we may have time for a few questions.